here we have on the couch, the screen. Sorry. Right, so I thought it'd be pretty good if we start at the very start beginning. Again. Start from the beginning. So what was the music that kind of uh, got you into it? Uh, underground garage, really. Just the sort of, just more darker two-step sort of stuff, like LBs, artworks. If anyone who listens to Garage, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you don't, I'll play some killer in it. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, just started DJing really at like 11. Just, and then wanted to take it to the next level of like, there weren't enough stuff what I wanted, and it wasn't as dark as I wanted it to be. So I thought I'd just start making some stuff just pretty dark. So you just said that you started DJing when you were 11. Mm. So where do you DJ when you're 11? In my bedroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I used to lurk around the record shops quite a bit. My brother used to uh, work in Big Apple which was like the main sort of underground headquarters in Croydon. And yeah, just started hanging about the record shops really. So you grew up in Croydon. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't know, it's like a particularly concrete, jungly yeah. part of South London. Yeah. And your brother was into music and was working at this, this big yeah. record shop. So you're 11 and you're DJing in your bedroom. Kind of what happens next? Nothing, you just sort of wait really. Wait until you get bored of that and then move on to the next thing, which was obviously production. Mm -hmm. which I uh, always didn't really know much about it when I started, as no one does, but I got introduced to like the PlayStation, making music on PlayStation, which it got boring pretty quick, so then I moved on to like Fruit Loops and stuff, which I still use now. Mm -hmm. I think I just oh, I sort of want to um, stick a little bit longer on this kind of really early point, you know, when you're yeah. like 11, 12, 13. So you talked a bit about sort of dark garage, but I don't know if any, everyone's going to sort of know exactly sort of where that is in context. What sort of music was this? This was the music that kind of came after Jungle and after Two Step. It was always there, really. It was just the sort of more instrumental stuff. You always had it on the B side, obviously. It was just, it was always, the instrumentals were always just a bit, there was more to them than the, the sort of bait vocal tracks, which were normally really cheesy and like, just sort of girl tunes, really. Do you know what I mean? Now, you said before that your brother was working in a record shop, but yeah. he's a DJ as well. Yeah, isn't he used he? to be in Internati with mm -hmm. Groove Rider, Fabio, Bailey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we sort of. So, what sort of stuff was he playing? Dark, dark, dark jungle, like the moving shadow sort of stuff, good looking, no U turn. Uh, just sort of really dark, dark jungle, really. Mm -hmm. And how did that influence you? Is that the sort of stuff, you know, would you, would no. you be listening to him playing in his bedroom? I used to think it was a racket. <laughs> <laughs> like, it wasn't until sort of I listen back to it now that I get my inf more influence, sort of. Because dub stuff is really a lot like the old jungle, it's just purely stripped down, minimal beats and bass, which I think it should have all, most music should have always stayed at, just kept it raw. Mm -hmm. so. What about, I mean, you, you mentioned. Um, you mentioned ELB as someone who yeah. really influenced you and sort of turned you on to the kind of things you wanted to do. Maybe can you play us something to sort of illustrate this yeah. uh, kind of early period of, of pre-dubstep? Cool. So what is it we're going to hear? Uh, it's a track called Buck and Berry. It was the first track I actually freaked over and I like, just really shocked out to. So. Can't 
start telling them about Canberry. Breaking the speakers already. Yeah, yeah. So where did you first hear that? Uh, forward, forward. I think uh, LB actually played it. Yeah, down forward. Mm -hmm. I used to go there when I was like 14, 15. Okay, so so for the uninitiated. Yeah, what's it was a, it's a club night in London, which basically just vo uh, focused on underground music as a whole. Uh, people who run it was like people who run Tempo, which is the main dubstep label, which I'm signed to. And yeah, it was just a place where you went to hear, it was the people who wanted to hear underground. Who, like, you could go to the big clubs and just hear sort of waste music all night, just sort of cheesy vocals and two-step. But then, yeah, it was, that was the place to go for underground. So you're like, what, do you say 13 or 14, no, no, I was 15? I when I say 15. OK, yeah. so you're 15. Um, you know, what, what, was, what was it like then? It was still coming from the garage thing, like, still the sort of champagne sort of, you know what I mean, shirts, jeans. But it was like, then the train spots started getting in, the journalists, and then it all started, then Garage started dying, and then Forward was sort of a place for, it was mainly man, men, <laughs> man music. Connecting with the masculine. Yeah, side, yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone said. But um, yeah, for ages it was just, it, it was just sort of never big crowds for quite, for a few years. It was just sort of just the heads who wanted mm. to hear it. See, it's funny you should say that, really, because I, I remember um, someone saying that there's a theory about clubs. Clubs are either about the music, they're about pulling, or they're about drugs. And it sounds like the whole scene is very much like the other things might be about it as well, but essentially it's kind of about the music and hearing it in the, in the best way possible. Yeah. Which way? Yeah, well, yeah. that's just the point. Well, how come? <laughs> um, so, so, like, if you're 15, you're going to these clubs, what does this mean? You're going to school the next day and falling asleep during maths? Yeah, pretty yeah. much, pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't, weren't really a great school lover. I think music was the only route I possibly could have taken. Mm. And so how did that start moving into, because by the time you were going to Forward, your, your tunes were already being played, weren't they? Well, not, not the first Forwards, it was like, it was a little while. I had to sort of try and get to a bar. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, Hatcher just, Hatcher all worked in Big Apple. If anyone so, knows about dubstep, Hatcher was like the pioneer, the only person playing it, like, the first sort of DJ playing dubs in garage, well not in garage, yeah, I suppose, so in garage, so. So let's, again, let's just sort of fill in the gaps here, so you started DJing in your room, kind of got quite good at that, started making music on the PlayStation and then... Well, I was, it wasn't PlayStation for too long, I got really bored. Yeah. Fruity Loops and yeah. started kind of like mucking about with yeah. that and making stuff. So how long did it take you to get to a point where you made something where you felt it was kind of good enough to show someone or... or after, about someone? A, after about a year, about 11 months to a year. Mm -hmm. Cause it wasn't a, it wasn't the greatest production, but it was different. It was sort of it was what Hatcher wanted, really. Mm -hmm. So. So, like you say, you spent a year kind of getting into it. Like, how how much time would you be spending making music? A lot of the time, homework time, <laughs> <laughs> just sitting on the computer. I just just sort of basically it was copying what LB and well, I was trying to copy what LB Z biases were doing. But obviously, they had like 10 grand studios, <coughs> and I had a free cracked plug, uh, cracked software. So it was, it was sort of through trying to copy them, I sort of got my own sound, and then just worked from there. Mm -hmm. So what, was, what do you think you were doing differently? Is it just the fact that you were just using sort of the most It was a lot basic? more stripped down than everything else. Like, it was just beats and bass, <coughs> and maybe an odd atmosphere or a sample rolling through the background. Mm -hmm. I mean, the beats and the bass, but it, that's the core of the whole sound, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Predominantly, yeah, it's definitely bass led. Mm -hmm. But yeah. And so, um, what was the, what was the first thing that you that you that got played out or that he that had just sort of took on? It was useless. I haven't brought it. <laughs> it was just like a four four thing with his name in. Mm -hmm. I tried to copy like a Jameson track. It was Jameson was like a four four sort of producer. And then yeah, that got played. But then I started, I started listening to sort of the LB production and stuff a bit more. And then was just like. Yeah, just like trying to copy him, but then to get my own sound in the pro in the process. Mm -hmm. So there's another guy that you're work that you've always Benga, yeah. worked with as well, yeah, isn't there? Yeah. And you two are doing stuff to get what well, sort of yeah, together weird. by Hatcher, weren't We you? actually met playing each other tunes down the phone. Like we had hadn't actually seen each other face to face. Like I met his brother, and his brother said, "Oh yeah, his mate wants to be a producer, and whatnot." Then we started playing each other tracks, and then become like pretty good friends, mm -hmm. and had our first release together. Mm -hmm. I think there's something quite interesting about this because at this point, you two are making records. <sighs> Basically, for Hatcher, aren't yeah. you? So he can have them yeah, yeah. exclusive. No one else had them. No. Mm -hmm. 
It's a really Jamaican way of doing things, isn't it? Were you sort of aware of that, or, no. or was it just, this is just how it works? That's just how it was. It was just, he was stubborn, really, and didn't want us to give it to anyone else. So how, how would that work? Would you be just kind of like saying to you, right, if you give me a tune, well, I'll we play was, it, but you we, can't give it to anyone we else? We was writing, like, ridiculous amount of tunes. We was doing, like, 30, 40 tracks a week. Mm -hmm. And just, he'd, we'd take them down to him, and whatever he'd play would sort of get heard. So you're like 30, 40 a week for the last, you know, five years? No, no, it's toned down a bit, it's toned down. It toned down when I got into sort of mixing down. I wasn't really bothered, I didn't really know nothing about engineering or nothing. When I started, I didn't even, weren't even aware of, like, EQs or nothing. So it was just, just the whole time just changing bass sounds and, like, twisting the bass and changing drums sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So there's a load of stuff that's really parallel to the way things have worked in Jamaica before, aren't there? That exclusivity, yeah, yeah, dubs, yeah. dubs, dubs, sound systems, yeah. the bass. Um, I've only just started realising that sort of stuff over the past year, mm. year and after, really. And why do you think that is? Digital Mystics had a lot to do with it. They sort of come with this earthy, raw, heavily reggae-influenced sound. And it was, I think they ended up making, I think the whole sound system thing in dubstep is, it was always at Plastic People, and Plastic People, like in London, it's quite a respected club, it's got a good sound system. So we were just used to hearing it on a good sound system, so we can't really hear it nowhere else. So. I mean, we were just chatting about this before, but one of the sort of things I think is really interesting about the whole sound is that if you hear it on the radio or just yeah, it's not the same at home, it kind of it can sort of fall flat. You don't get the full punch of the whole thing. Yeah. But as soon as you've heard it live and you've heard it coming through big speakers in a you know, dirty, dark, sweaty yeah. club, then it, you know there's an instant moment of, of connection with it as, as it being something yeah, really yeah. amazing. Um, but it's, we've all been brought up, like all the producers have been brought up in on a good system. So I think that's just a lot to do with it, really. Mm -hmm. So which which places in London, if anyone's going to be there, should they be Plastic people. Out? Plastic people are uh, Brixton Mass every other month when uh, DMZ, Digital Mystics hold the night DMZ. They say if you're ever in London, you've got to make it down there because if you haven't really experienced dubstep, that's the place to experience it. Mm -hmm. Either Plastic People or Mass, yeah. OK, so for the people who were at, you know, your gig on Friday, yeah. you know, if you've got, like, a scale of 1 to 10 and that was whatever, like, where's... The crowd was 10. Mm. The crowd was amazing. Like, it was like, felt like being in London. Like, people was freaking and it's good when you come this far away from home and people know what you're playing. It's sort of weird, it's weird almost, because they're asking... So I got asked to play tracks that I've only cut last week. And it's like, how do you know about it? Obviously the internet, but it's just pretty freaky. Mm -hmm. This is the Bear Files massive, maybe. Yeah, Bear Files, say. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, on Friday you got handed a pair of boxing gloves, I noticed. What was that all about? Random. Mm -hmm. Completely random. It freaked me out a bit as it goes. I weren't sure whether he wanted to fight me or what. <laughs> but, uh, I thought it was something like an Australian thing. <laughs> Maybe like it was just something really special and important he had and he was trying to show you a lot of love by giving you some kind of weird looking boxing gloves. I think that's, that's a mystery that's never going to be solved. Whatever floats your boat, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so the clubs that we're talking about in London, Forwards, DMZ, um, are they kind of like? Croft Institute for the people that haven't been there or maybe aren't going to be there. You know, what are they dark. like? It's to similar, that? like dark, like not really much lighting, not really no no visuals because it's just basically there to concentrate on the music. Mm -hmm. You don't need. I think visuals and that are just sort of something to hide a bad sound system or something, something to cover something else up. Mm -hmm. So basically, I mean, it, like it's there in the music and it's there in the clubs and it's there in the, the presentation. It's it's all about the basics, isn't it? The whole yeah. sound, it's about stripping out everything you don't need. So the clubs are dark, sweaty, smoke holes yeah. with one light, but massive speakers. Yeah. And the music similarly, like everything that doesn't need to be in there yeah, is taken there. out. Yeah, but it's, it's the way it should be. Like, overcrowded music, it's, it's not always nice to the ears, is it? Right. Well, let's, let's hear a couple of things that you've done. There were two tracks you were talking about earlier that have both got <coughs> a big, heavy sort of dub influence. Yeah, this we're one's about sound system, a track so. called Irie. It was uh, when I first started sort of getting sort of into the sort of reg like listening to a lot more dub sort of stuff. Awesome. No breaking the speakers. Yeah.
going on. Yeah. Here. So I guess, I guess the guys that are running the sound system at the clubs have got yeah. to really know what they're doing. Mm. Well, you've got to know what you're doing whenever you're dealing with sound, I guess. Mm. You know? Obviously, um, that sounded wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded wrong. What I'm saying is there's, there's, there's a, a, that whole massive culture around speakers and sound systems and making sure that everything's properly on point. Yeah. Um, so let's just talk a minute about that record. So when did you do it? How did it come about? I think I've done it sort of in, like, January, February. It was just... I just started hearing, like, Koki, Mallow at Digital Mystics, they were doing this sort of really heavily musical dub sound and stuff, and it was just really cool, because I hadn't really heard nothing like it out. And it was just basically just... Then started wanting to tap into that sort of side of things, because it just adds another whole contrast to set, playing out, and just to you as a producer, really, because then you just start branching out, just trying different things, just listening to, like, the old dub records and just seeing the methods they used. Mm. <coughs> so, so from that, if you're listening to kind of old stuff as well, is there anything specific that you're taking from that? Is it, are you listening to the way that they're kind of... Just all stuff where it's structured, just effects and, yeah, just the way it's been built. Mm. And you were saying as well there's like another dub influence record that you could play, like, next to that to, to uh, show sort of like a different sound, something, um, what was it, the bass and beats thing? Oh, saying? yeah, yeah. Just the whole way bass runs the track, runs dubstep, really. It's just, just a track I've done called Blipstream. It's basically, I just spent all the time on the bass. It's pretty stripped down and pretty crackly as well. Yeah, you just, just see the way it's basically just the bass driving you sort of throughout. It's like just a little sort of hook around it, just to keep your mind going, I guess. Mm -hmm. when, when, did, uh, when did that come out? When, not that come out, out on when Vine, oh, uh, <coughs> March, April. Mm -hmm. yes. I think there's something about the, the sound that's really, like when you're hearing it out loud, it's really, it's very the heavy. The bass actually grabs you and sort of takes you. But it's heavy in a very physical way, because I think especially for some of the people, talking to people who were there on Friday who hadn't really heard it before, quite shocked by the, the sort of impact. Because it's not often you go out and you're kind of physically kind of um, pulled somewhere by a sound. Is that something like, say, is that something that brought you into it or is that just the way you feel when you're out and you're hearing it? Or it's just it? that feeling, the feeling of the bass rattling in your chest and sort of in your throat that you're just like, yeah, fucking like, Up here in your nose, yeah. yeah. It just, it's just like, yeah, it just feels cool. Mm -hmm. oh, there, was, there was a funny comment off uh, just some forum somewhere where someone was saying, I've never heard a music which rattles your ribcage and makes you feel over the moon at the same time, which I thought was uh, like quite a funny way of, of looking at it. Um, so we talked about bass, we talked a bit about how you started DJing and how you started making music. Where does Pirate Radio come into the story? Well, Pirate Radio is big for any underground music, really. It's like the, it's where you hear the new music. And it's, it was just, yeah, it's just like all kids at school, that's where you, if you want to be the cool sort of people, music people, you listen to pirate radio, because it's the sort of freshness. Mm -hmm. So you don't, I'm not, not 
all countries have that culture, but in, in Britain... It's always been a big thing in London. Like, in Britain, in, in London in particular, been. there's yeah. pirate radios everywhere, aren't there? And they spring up, and you can't... They're unstoppable. They're kind of like you try and... People, the authorities try and bosh them down, and a new one will pop up somewhere yeah. else. But I suppose because there's always so much music and so many people kind of inventing their own scenes that yeah. that's always expressed through pirate radio. What, what was the first pirate station you played on? Uh, Flight FM, which was just a sort of just in the back of some scrapyard, really. You just have to climb for about three metal fences to get to it. It's pretty pointless, really. Like, uh, it was, yeah, then, then I ended up on Rinse, which is really shouldn't be pirate. It should be legal, because it's been going strong for like 10 years, and it's always been playing the cream of what people want to hear, which I think a lot of radio stations don't do that. You might have like a station that plays one hour, two till three in the morning of music that people actually want to hear. Mm -hmm. How, how did you get your first pirate gig? How did that happen? Did you have just to through like production, really? Just through like giving Hatcher stuff, and then people want to then start hearing more from the producer rather than through the DJ. Mm -hmm. Cause so people came to you rather than you going to them. Well, no, they actually went to Hatcher to get in contact with me, or they went to Big Apple, the record shop, to mm -hmm. find me. Mm -hmm. And then what about rinse? Because like playing on pirate station, it's not like playing on a legal station, isn't it? It's not like you go to the studio and there's some yeah. guy on security checking who you are and you know inviting you up and wants, seeing if you want a cup of tea. What's it like to play on a pirate radio station in London? Well, the first few times you always do it, it's nervous, like just nerve wracking. You think DTR are going to burst in and take your records off you. This is the Department of Trade yeah. and Industry. Basically, you've always got that thought they will take, they come and take your records off you. They take everything that's in the building. And that's pretty sort of a fright <coughs> frightening feeling because your records are your life, I think. It's sort of how you express yourself. So, but yeah, the radio station is pretty mad. I remember going, once Rince was in, used to go to the top of these like, dirty tower block flats and the actual studio was in a box in the wall. So you walked into the room and then got in, sort of got into the wall and it was sort of like six foot high. I used to have to like crouch down in there. And like, you'd have like four or five people just sweating it out, all just to play some tunes on radio. It's just like, yeah, it's pretty like dedicated, really. <laughs> it's to come out stinking. <laughs> <laughs> so like, so okay. So at this point, rinse is sort of. Uh, you have to go up to the bottom, you know, go find some room in the tower block, and uh, then there's just a hole in the wall. Well, no, that was, yeah, sorry, that was a one-off. That was like. Yeah, that was a one-off. Mm -hmm. Normally, it'd just be someone's kitchen or some sort of crack flat somewhere or something. Mm -hmm. So you've got kitchens, crack flats, yeah. <laughs> holes in the yeah, wall. It's, pretty, it's not really it's inviting. Yeah, it weren't really nice going places when you're like 15. Mm. It's just sort of places you didn't want to be, but you had to be to get your stuff heard, mm. I guess. And what's the, what, what's the vibe like when you're in there and you're on air? The first sort of few months is just pure nervousness. Because then you sort of, you get there and think, oh, this is nothing. It's like being in your bedroom, but then you sort of realise how many people are listening, and it's like, right, I've got to talk now. <laughs> I've never talked like that on radio. And it's like, then you just keep thinking about how you sound, how you mix in. So say you do a dodgy mix, you're like, ah, oh, then you're not really in it no more. Mm. So it's, it, yeah, it's just pretty nerve-wracking, first of all, but now it's, it just comes natural, really. Mm -hmm. so, so tell us about your, tell us about Rinse Now. Rinse Now is good. It's basically, it's trying to go legal, so it's stopped the FM. It's just uh, just doing internet, which is pretty cool because now you can get all the SMS, uh, all the email and sort of SMS, which is cool. Because uh, now, like people, you can hear me out here, which is a big step. Like I'll get texts from like Ukraine and like texts from Portugal, like all over the place, which is really good. It's like amazing sort of feeling because you can't do that with a legal station in England because it only reaches England. Mm -hmm. So. So in a way, like them coming off air. Yeah, it's done it Essentially, it's, it's been a good thing because yeah. it means that it's, uh, your dubstep nation is expanding yeah. at just outside There's actually the no reason for it to go legal now mm. because what's the point? If it was to go legal, it's, it's stopping itself from spreading. Mm. I guess that's, that's like one of those weird sort of internet yeah. swerve balls, isn't it, yeah. that you weren't expecting? But well, it's yeah, actually, yeah. you can imagine the impact of that is quite massive because yeah. now you've got people making dubstep. You know, yeah. you're just saying on the way up here, there's people making tunes in America, in America yeah, and there's, everywhere. There's a big sort of scene for it in America now. Loads of good producers as well. You've got uh, like a guy called Lexus and Drop the Lime, who I think was in Brisbane Saturday. He was playing in Brisbane Saturday, which was pretty weird. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's cool. It's, it's pretty mad how the sound's spreaded. Not that it's, it's happened quickly, because it's been in London for, like, say, five or six years, but the impact since January when we've done the Radio 1 show. Mm -hmm. Since then, it's, it's crazy. I was in New York in June. 
and it's like Hank Shockley from Public Enemy was a, and it's like, he's a legend, you know what I mean? And he's sort of standing in the booth with me as I'm playing and it's like, right, this doesn't add up. But it's, you sort of go places and they're freaking out to your tunes that you've made. You've sort of made to, not made to play in London, but you initially just thought you'd be playing it in London. And sort of now, I'm sitting here. Mm. So it's, it's pretty trippy. Mm. Pretty trippy, indeed. Yeah. Um, so just, that, you just mentioned Radio One. Yeah. For people that don't know, what happened in January? There was the dubstep was, it was basically Marianne Hobbs, who's always had a sort of new music show, she decided to have uh, two hours just dedicated to dubstep, which no one ever... Had this is on Radio, Radio One, which one, is the, BBC. the national pop yeah. music station, yeah. isn't it? And it was just crazy. Like, the vibe in the studio was everyone was just smiling, everyone was on such a good one, everyone was drinking, everyone was doing whatever. It was just... It was... It was surreal. Like, we were all running about the Radio One studio, like, Zane Lowe, who's, like, a pretty big DJ, was, like, just walking past us and it's like... It, it still seems surreal now. I listen back to the, to the whole show and I still get the tingles up, like, up my spine. It's, mm. it's mad because since then it's, it's just, gone old, just gone up. I mean, you said, like, you know, we're all in the studio, blah, 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 blah. Like, who was there? What uh, was happening? It was me, Digital Mystics, uh, Vexed, Distance, Hatcher, Code 9 and Space Ape and so Lofa. the all-stars, basically. Yeah, just the, the Magnificent Seven. As, a, as I call it, tend to call us, but yeah, it was it was mad. It was really, really surreal. And it's, I, I never feel, I don't think I'll ever feel the feeling that everyone felt that night ever again, mm -hmm. because it was sort of the emails and stuff that were coming in. It was like, not we've done it. It was like we've finally got the point across of you can make what you want to make and get away with it. You haven't got to be forced into making commercial house or commercial whatever. That you can take something from the underground up. I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other really interesting thing about the whole scene is how, like, if, if you, if you um, were to look at the spectrum of different people that are in the scene... Yeah, it's not like just something one... between you yeah. and it, Burial, for yeah, example. it's totally different. Like, unbelievably different. It's, it's contrasted. It's not... I think that's what people like, because it's not... It's all dubstep, but there's so much variety. You've got sort of vexed and distance who makes sort of more drum and bass influence. You've got Burial, who I'm not sure what he's inspired by, but he's heavy. Like, it's pretty, pretty mad production. You've got Code 9, who's really sort of laid back, chilled out sort of production. You've got Digital Mystics, well, between three of them, they've got sort of it all covered. You've got Lofo, who's more beats based. You've got Mallory, who's pure spiritual. And then you've got Koki, who's just ill. Koki, who's yeah. just ill. Koki, who's just mm -hmm. ill. Like, every track you listen to by Koki, it's just like, <laughs> like you just the bass just takes you away. Mm. There was um, something that Burial said. He said, um, there's a quote from him which says, someone asked him about um, uh, like what the sound is of the scene, and he said, there are no highway lights to attract rubbish producers, everyone's just off wandering, which I thought was quite a good kind He's of expression. Deep. He's deep. Pretty deep. But in a way, that kind of sums up, for me, one of the things that's so appealing about it, because somehow there's something that connects it. Maybe it's the bass, maybe it's a stripped down, maybe it's the, kind of the renegade of come, thing. Everyone has... Everyone who's there was always, before, was into a sort of not so popular music. And I think, I think everyone just thought, sort of just unite, mm -hmm. basically, and just, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So is there like a strong sense of family within the scene? Yeah, definitely. It's, there's not no competition as of yet. There, obviously there will be, because it always happens, but it's, like, we're all really, like, close friends. Like, everyone will see one of the other producers, like, once a week. Like, I see Malib, like, every day. Like, obviously, life for every other sort of week. It's everyone's just really tight, and it's when you're out, you sort of sense it because <coughs> everyone's drinking together. Like, it's not like if you go to a house club and like another house producer won't be talking to another house producer. It's sort of like, get off my decks. Like, my turn. Do you <laughs> know what I mean? But it's everyone's like, you get everyone will book everyone for each other's nights, and it's there's like a real, it's a family thing mm. at the moment. And what's that doing to the music? Well, it's no one's got nothing to worry about as if. Like, no one thinks that oh, I better not let him come to my studio because he'll see what I'm using, or that like, I better not let him in know my technique because otherwise he'll start rubbing it. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of everyone's helping each other, like, everyone's playing each other's tracks. Just, yeah, just all, everyone's just pushing each other at the moment. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it stays like that forever. And I think if it does, it should be around for a, a little while. Mm -hmm. For a little while. Well, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Have you got something else you can play us? Uh, yeah. 
Um, this one's a, it's a remix I've done of a techno track by um, a guy from Leeds in England called Mark Ashton, or Ashford, one of the two. But yeah, I just kept it, I wanted to do something like, because I've been like, listening to quite a bit more minimal techno, and sort of, yeah, that's where the idea from the remix sort of come from. I don't actually normally sound like all that sort of rumbling. It's like something's going on in there. <laughs> okay, so just well, tell us something about that. I got just got approached by uh, a minimal techno label. I'm not actually too sure what it's called, but it was through sort of a friend of a friend, and they just was really up for me doing a remix. Mm -hmm. They really liked the request line, mm -hmm. and it just sort of they said it linked back to some. It reminded them of some techno track, so. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see what I could do with the parts, but I actually done that in like an hour. I had the parts for about four months and just could never really be bothered to do it. And then they rang me up and said, we need to master it in the morning. It was like, all oh, right. <laughs> and then I just sort of done that one in about an hour. So, yeah. It's normally the, the tracks that I normally spend more time on, I don't normally end up liking. It's the tracks that I do and say, not an hour, but say hour and a half, two hours, three hours, whatever, that normally my stronger tracks. I feel when I try and spend too much time on anything, it just... I feel I'm trying to go too deep, that how people want me to go into building a track. And, mm. yeah. And what about the 10-inch thing? It's just cheaper than 12s. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, uh, I think it was just through Hatcher, really. Hatcher always cut 10s, and it was just always just a thing of cutting 10s. But to be honest, 12-inch 12, 12 dubs do actually sound better. So don't ever get confused that 10 inches do sound better, because they don't. Mm -hmm. They're just cheaper as well. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Sounds really good, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Cheap sky. So, what about other remixes that you've done? Um, I've done just some stuff just within the scene, really. Just some remixes. Done. Um, 
just for just some new producers really that I was really feeling and I felt not that if I do a remix that it's really going to help them but it was just just to show people that like even though they're, they're real, new producers that like, no one's really heard on their stuff that are still going to do stuff for them mm -hmm. like, just that back to that family thing like they're cool if they're safe and cool it's, why not do a remix for them like it's, it's not going to hurt you any like hurt you mm -hmm. your reputation so after all these years, of, well, obviously, you know, you're essentially a veteran, like we were saying yeah. earlier. So do you, are you seeing now kids coming through who are the same age that you were when you first started? Mm, sort of. It's more people around my age now. You get the, m the more younger sort of kids now want to make grime because it's sort of, as with the grime thing, if you can get it played with the right MC, then it's a big tune. Mm. Like, all you need is an MC to do a phrase over it, and then that's it, it's a big tune. Mm. I mean, you're unusual in the scene in the, the grime people kind of like your stuff, don't they? Yeah, I think that's just more more to do with Requestline, really, because Requestline was sort of <coughs> big, big in sort of grime. It was, I think it it got ended up getting bigger in grime than it did in dubstep. You're talking about Midnight Requestline. Oh yeah, Midnight Requestline. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I'm not too sure, but. Mm. Nah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I mean, maybe this is a good moment to play Midnight Request Line. If you I think they want to change the cartridge. <laughs> I haven't got it on CD. OK, well, maybe let's talk about... Because um, you've got an album coming out. It's out today. It's out today. Yeah, I've just found out. I've got a phone yeah. call saying they bought it today. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't actually got no copies on me. I think there's some, I think there's some coming over, but don't quote me. Well, I've got it upstairs. Oh, okay. Maybe towards the end, because it'd be yeah. good to yeah. play. Do you want to play request line or? Um, no. 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 Um, if you, I you haven't got any, have you got anything? Have you got the um, tapper track? Tapped. Tapped. Yeah. What the one with DMC or without? Uh, There's like three mixes of it. Well, maybe you should decide then. All right. Uh, one minute. <coughs> this is one with a. Uh, Basically, I'd done an instrumental and I wanted to get it vocaled and uh, I chose JME, who's a pretty good grime MC. Like, I chose him because he's not, he's not one of the ones who just talks purely on beef. He talks... I knew he'd sort of... I wanted to come with a paranoid flow because I've got this thing that Big Brother is watching all of us and everything's being listened to, do you know what I mean? I know it's pretty paranoid, but that's what I wanted to come across in this. Mm -hmm. And he'd done it pretty well. So this, let's just make sure it's all clear. So basically, this is like the one thing with a grime MC yeah, on the album. That I'll probably ever do. That you'll probably ever do. Yeah. All right then. <coughs> Play it away. And it's exactly like... Yeah, I'll turn it off. <laughs> J.M.E. J-M-E 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 21st Serious. century technology Serious. Mobile phones, internet It's not safe anymore Big Brother's watching The phones get tapped Serious, serious In fact, sometimes I think back Some days I felt trapped My line's been tapped My line's been tapped Sometimes I think back, serious. some days I felt trapped, trapped, my line's been tapped, serious. In fact, sometimes I think back, some days I felt trapped, my line's been tapped, my line's been tapped, tapped. Sometimes I think back, serious. some days I felt trapped, trapped, my line's been tapped, serious. Answer my phone, yeah, who's that? Hello? Ain't you gonna chat? I can't hear nothing, I've got a full battery and reception blood all back. I still can't hear chat. Yo, I don't know what's going on. I think maybe this phone is whack. Either that or my line's in tap. In fact, sometimes I think back. Some days I felt trapped. My line's been tapped. My line's been tapped. tapped. Sometimes I think back. Serious. Some days I felt trapped. trapped. My line's been tapped. It's like the matrix, the system we're trapped in I told you but you won't ever listen Until the day when you get attacked and Some of your proper egos missing Fed on road, they use police tactics To cut off the man, them on a mission If they ever got your phone and they tapped it Serious, you know that you're trapped in
By the way, can I just say this ain't how these tracks sound? It's because these dub plates have been absolutely hammered. So, if they sound a bit sketchy, that's why. <laughs> so, what, what changes for you if you're putting a vocal on a track? I tend to still like the beat to be pretty, pretty a lot going on. So I don't want it to be the vocal that dominates the track because then it's the vocal a lot of the time makes the track. But there, it's sort of exactly what I wanted. Every, every down to like every word he said is sort of what I was, what I had in mind to go over it. And that's why I picked him because I thought he'd, he'd be the only person that could sort of hit hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. Did you find if you're putting, obviously it's not the case with that one, but if you're putting vocals on there which could sort of lighten things, you compensating in other parts of the record to make it darker or harder? I sort of, the, the instrumental for that was done before I even had vocal in one, mm -hmm. so that's not really a better one to... Mm. What about the, there's a Warrior Queen? The Warrior Queen before. thing was, was so freaky, it's unreal, like, I've done this track and I had in mind getting Warrior Queen on it because I'd done a remix for a label for her and I'd done it and I didn't, I'd never met her once in my life and then the day I finished it that evening I got an email from Warrior Queen's management saying I was interested in doing a track. And if that ain't weird, then I don't know what it is. It was sort of, it was like Saint sent, uh, sent the company a message that no one had even heard the churn. But I'd done it with Warrior Queen in mind, like all the space for her and everything. And yeah, they contacted me that night, and that's how the track with Warrior Queen come about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't suppose you got uh, it. But it sounds pretty, oh. pretty hammered. Okay, <laughs> pretty hammered. Now, why is that? Well, because people jump over the decks and start reloading tunes when you're out. They get now, their hands all over them. This is something I really, in fact, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that's so funny, that whole thing about on the scene when people want to get rewind, it's no longer it's like us, calling for it, is I, it? People I run up to the decks and press stop. It's sort of my own fault because at one of the DMZ parties, I'd done it and then there was this quote, screams guilty, and then it just, everyone just seemed to start being guilty, mm. leaning over. But it can get, it can get pretty annoying because it's like you're sort of trying to play, so you've only got an hour set and people keep leaning over and stopping it. It's like, I've got more than enough to play, so it's, it sometimes gets pretty annoying. And then you always get one person who keeps doing it and keeps doing it, and it's like, go away. So how do you deal with that? You can't really deal with it. Mm. <laughs> Unless you're going to jump over and knock them out, then I Maybe suppose. that's what the boxing gloves were for. <laughs> <laughs> something else I wanted to ask you about playing out is... Um, uh, there was some of the zinc saying something about how out of the stuff he's playing probably 80% of it is unreleased and probably 30 yeah. or 40% of that is stuff that only he's got what are the proportions like for you? Yes, like the same really that will be the majority of stuff I play comes out but I'll get stuff off other people that's not never going to come out because it's just it's just the DJ thing of being exclusive to tracks and being the only person with them like why are you going to go out and play the same set as someone else, it's pretty pointless. Mm -hmm. I think most DJs want an individual sort of set. So I think that's more or less that. So what kind of things, <coughs> like what's your special special? What special special special? <laughs> I don't know, I've got loads. There's, I've got loads of stuff. It's where I'm sort of quite, know everyone in the scene, I can sort of have dibs on anything, mm -hmm. I guess. But it's more, it's better to have your own stuff because the, the other producers are playing out a lot, and if you keep playing everyone else's new stuff, then there's never going to be no, no time yeah. for your own. So how much, so if you've got 80% unreleased, 30 to 40% only that is exclusive to you, how many, how much of your set is going to be you? 60. 60% me. Mm -hmm. like I only really play stuff if I really like it, or stuff that I know someone wants pushed. Mm -hmm. Like say someone's got a track coming out, then you push it, you help them push it. Mm -hmm. So who else do you play? Digital Mystics, Benga, uh, Anti-Social Entertainment, which I know, to whoever's into dubstep, like, keep an ear out, because they're pretty good. Um, uh, Iron Soul, who's another, he's another new guy. Yeah, that's it, really, like, Lofa, obviously, Digital Mystics, mm -hmm. so... Mm -hmm. Have you got anything that you can play us that is a... Of someone else? Yeah, that's in your set yeah. at the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's cranky. Maybe it might even be the one that nearly blew my head off on Friday night. Where is it? Right, this is actually for Jeff. Marijuana upon the corner 
Is actually one of my favourite tracks at the minute. It, it goes down everywhere. It's, has anyone who ever had the original, do you agree with me that aspect in the original? It's like, it's sick. <laughs> so, what sort of. Uh, obviously, you played here on Friday and you played in Brisbane on, like, on the weekend. Yeah. Uh, what kind of um, reaction are you getting to that? Uh, Friday was better than Saturday. Because mm. uh, I think just basically down to the smoking laws, people's in and out of the club all night smoking. Reactions everywhere are pretty good. <laughs> Unless I played, in, I played a gig in Holland and I played after some like fresh metal drum and bass and it was like, how can you put, it's like dropping the tempo, it was like, I sort of stood there and just really didn't want to play. It's just, like, it's just common sense really, isn't it? mm. it's just bad prom promoter really. Yeah, I mean maybe that's, when do you think that kind of the tempo thing is something that's made, made it all sound so heavy? Mm, well I think it's the bass really that makes mm. it heavy. Yeah. Probably. Come on, love. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay then. So, how about uh, tell us a bit about Midnight Request Line? I hear that it you nearly didn't do anything with it. No, I've done it like literally two Christmases ago. I was just bored, bored of the festive season, and I sat down and just wanted to do something a bit different. It started off, which is weird. I don't really tell many people. It started off as a grime thing, but then I went a bit more deeper into it, and I just start. I give it to a couple of people, and everyone was a bit like. Because it was the first time I'd really gone, like I'd started like doing the arpeggiator type thing, and I think it took people quite a while to sort of accept it. <coughs> and then, like about a year, two years later, youngster started playing it at forward, and then it just it all started going from there. Like when I was playing it, and it was sort of getting starting to get good reaction, and then where youngster started playing it, it was getting more reaction, and then like Roll Deep, who were like quite a big grime sort of crew in England, were hammering it which helped sales quite a bit. And then, like, Ricardo Villabolos, Techno DJ, was playing it. Giles Peterson was playing it. Mm. Uh, like, there was just people that I'd never even heard of before that was playing it, and then I was finding out after how respected they are. Mm. And then the track, yeah, the track's done me blinding. <laughs> the Villa Lobos has been in touch about you doing a mix, hasn't he? No, no, he wants to do a mix. He wants to do a mix? Yeah, he wants to do a, a mix of something. We're not 100% sure yet, mm -hmm. but he's, he is up for it. So it's quite funny, isn't it, how over the last six months things have suddenly changed from being just there for the people that are in the scene and suddenly people who are into music generally but yeah. aren't necessarily dubstep heads at all <coughs> have got really into it. I mean, you played festivals over the summer. Yeah, yeah, festivals. You must be seeing different people, kind of, you know, different musicians and different techno, a lot of, of music uh, people getting into techno it. Techno sort of fans are getting into it. I think it's just people from other genres need, need a voice to show them because otherwise it's just like... Oh, what are they doing sort of thing. So where I think Villa Bolos played it, it was like, oh right, he's playing it, then we should like it. Not, not as such, but sort of, some people need to be false fed something before they actually accept it. Do you reckon that's it though? Do you reckon it's about them thinking, oh, if someone else is doing it, it makes it okay? Or do you not yeah, think yeah, it's just no. them hearing it and just... Well, some, I'm not saying everyone, but a lot of the time, people need to be voiced things in a certain mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So basically, I mean, really, over the last six months, lots of really good things have happened, but is, is, it, is there anything changing that's not so good? Or is it all good? It's all good at the minute. <laughs> like, the only thing, some of the press are getting some things really wrong. And like, I keep trying to look for some, somewhere to put it that's not actually there. Like, 
everyone always assumes there's a deeper feeling behind something when there's not. Mm. It's like you get this like four page essay on a track. It's like, oh yeah, they was thinking this. It's like, no, we weren't. Just like you just write the chance. Just, some of the press like, is, is sort of ruining some things. Mm. So basically, don't think about it too much. Yeah, don't think about it too much. Mm -hmm. just, just listen. Mm -hmm. And what about some of the other sort of influences to the sounds we've talked about, Doug? What about, and we sort of talked about two step a little bit and the dark garage thing, but is there anything else that, that has been influential that would uh, be worth mentioning? I listen, yeah, I listen to a lot of funk, so like a lot of disco. I love disco. I've been listening to a lot of sort of like gold rap of a sort of, I don't know what to pronounce them as, but I've been listening to like a lot of Hot Chip, like Hot Chip, the new band from New York, were pretty cool. And like they're different, they're really different. They lose like sort of weird sounds that you wouldn't hear nowhere else shoes, but they put them off really well. So it's, yeah, I've just mm -hmm. been listening to like quite a lot of different stuff. Mm -hmm. And is that all feeding into, like if you get into stuff like that, does that feed in directly into what you're doing? Sort of, it's not that you just, you start to look at things in different ways. Mm -hmm. And then you start to look at your own music in a different way and think, is someone going to listen to this in 10 years like I'm listening to stuff now? Mm -hmm. But like what? Can you give us, like, is there a, a sort of concrete example of a way that something, you, you sort of it's discovered something, something and then it's fed in? No, something just influenced, like, as most of you know, like, just bit through making music, you just get, you just sort of, you just take the music in and you don't sort of go back and try and make a tune like that. You just try and make a tune that gives you the feeling that that track gave you, which is a pretty hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one other thing, we've talked a lot, sort of, for some reason, a couple of times about nicknames and how they've come up. Did someone give you your name or no. did you do it? I used to write, like, tag, so mm -hmm. that's just how that came about. Mm -hmm. And it was before the film was out, so if anyone thinks I got the name from the film, I'd yeah. never. Um, so, what about just another, another, well, how about something new that other people aren't, well, have you got something new you can play on? Yeah. Oh, I can play the thing with Warrior Pain. Yeah. Well, this is off the album. It's, uh, this is the tune that I didn't think I had that uh, was the weird one where they sort of got in contact with me after. Good one is very hard to find. No more fire, I'll be cool. I'm about to try to scratch mine. Some girl, them know what is them have a dirty habit. Say, I'm going to live good and find him, them one pitch. <laughs> you can't get them off, you know? I itch them itch. Check it. Sure. Now see, can you find a way the Bible tell me? Also, I've done that because there seemed to be a lot more girls coming out and there weren't really nothing. You know, a good girl's like a singer on coming. You know, you do. <laughs> so it was like, it was you just saying, yeah. do you know what I mean? It was just saying to get to, to show them I appreciate them coming out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think really, you know, we're going to go over to some questions on the floor in a minute, but I don't think we can finish um, this without kind of pointing out that you, you like to have a good time, don't you? I do. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't? I think, I think we've noticed already this kind of like, you know, the Scream Team, Screamadelic 
kind of chaos that seems to occur around you. Do you think, is that part of the reason why the music sounds so good? It's good time music. But then some people say it's not. You get a lot, some people just like, like, to, like to put it down, but I just like having a good time. It's not actually really got nothing to do with music, it's just me in general. It's like enjoying myself. Like, who don't, who like wants to go out and have a bad night? <laughs> <laughs> Not you, that's for sure. Not me. All right, and so who's got some questions? OK, where's the microphone? I've got a couple of questions. Yeah. Transition, transition mastering, very good. If anyone wants the address or anything, they can come and get it after. And uh, also, I'm just uh, following up on that. I'm just seeing that uh, in the mastering process, the yeah. visual to analog. To be honest, I'm not, I'm not fully, I wouldn't be able to fully explain all that side of it to you. Okay. I'm just the software boy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? No, no? cool. Okay. Cheers, man. Um, you saying you use the tools? Yeah. FL Studio, yeah. Right, I just wondered, so all the songs you use are, are getting songs to the software or you use external? No, no, I only use, only use FL Studio, only like, so, like software plugins and stuff. Like, just anything, anything I can make a bass line on, really. So, I mean, like, the thing is everyone's a bit prejudiced when it comes to Fruit Loops, because it's like, because it's so simple, people seem to have a problem with it, but why? If I can do in that what some people can do in Logic, then why not? It's like, it's my little playground that I can, I sort of know like the back of my hand, so why not? Do you know, I, can do, I can do the same in it, what a lot of people can do in Cubase and Logic, but it, the only bad thing with Fruit Loops is it's not 24-bit, and I wish, as soon as it's 24-bit, then I think that's Mac out the window for me, so, yeah, cool. Okay, any others? I've got a question at the back there. Are we down to one mic? Anything? No, 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 it's not in for it loops, no. It's anything, you can make a bass from anything. Any, any tone you can make a bass from. It's, uh, like, you can, it's just, they're just tones. It's, it's more of the, the getting the sound you want than how to make a bass more, if you know what I mean? Yeah. If that makes any sense whatsoever. No, it does. I mean, I mean, it's just because your bass is really solid. Well, it's, down, it's still down to, it's, it's not necessarily the bass sound, it's, it's the frequencies you're cutting and the frequencies you're pushing into the bass. Because you can make a bass line and like, if you don't compress it, don't EQ it or whatnot, it can start to sound pretty weak. Do you know what I mean? But then when you try and over sort of compress and over EQ, so it can also sound weak. So it's just getting the balance right, really. It's just getting everything its own space within the actual sound. That's why I tend like not to overcut the music sort of thing. But, yeah. So I can find a better answer. Hi, are you working on a, on a PA or what kind of speaker are you using? Because uh, to be honest, I've got it? some I've got some really whack tannoys, old tannoys that someone give, bought me for Christmas, and it's. But I think it helps because it's the sort of thing someone's going to listen to their radio for. And I feel where a lot of my tunes are getting played on radio, I think that helps because they're not the best monitors in the world at all, they're just some, like, tannoys, but it's, if I can get a nice mix down on them, then I know it's going to sound nice coming through really nice speakers. Well, I hope so, anyway. So, yeah, they're just really old, really bait. So that's avoiding that dilemma of your record sounding amazing in the studio and not working unless you've got those sort of speakers. But the thing is, you never really know how your track's going to sound until you've heard it in, like, four or five different places, anyway. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, who is next on the question front? Hi. What's happening? Um, so, slide the touch a little bit more on the bass thing. Yeah. Um, if you're not using amazing speakers, um, and you're talking a little bit more about just boosting the harmonics, because that's what yeah. I mean when you hear bass. Yeah. Yeah, of course. 
do you have like a preferred EQ or something that you're using, or how did you go about figuring it out? To be honest, most. A lot, well, I, well, I say a lot of EQs sort of work the same. It's just, it's just sort of like, just where you're cutting certain things and pushing others. Like, I tend to cut my bases at 30, where a lot of other people cut them at 40. But if you're playing on a good system, it will normally reach as low as, like, say, 20 hertz. So, well, you might as well get the full impact out of it if you're going to plan it. So, yeah. Who's next? You've got another note, you said? No. All oh, right. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. Um, what do you think about singers and you know, adaptive music? Um, I, I wouldn't really like it to go into the full on vocal. Like, like say, an eight bar before the drop or something would be nice for so. Just if I'd like someone else to do it, because then that can be their thing almost. But it's not really my thing. The Warrior Queen thing I really like, but that's more of the. It reminds me of like an old dub plate that I could imagine someone playing that I really would have been feeling. It's just sort of, it sounds pretty freestyle-y. Like it doesn't sound like there's too much effort gone into the rec like recording and stuff of the vocal. So, sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Anything else? No. No, that's it. All right then, we'll end with Swain. Thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> it's gonna, uh, we'll play the press out. We'll play the press out.